Okay, let's continue. Uh, we're at Revelation 20, verse 7. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth. So it's going to be a global affair, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. And their number is like the sand of the sea. So, here we go. It's like, when will mankind learn? Satan is back in business. But remember, he's back in business only as allowed by God. This is still part of God's plan. This is part of the trials of sifting the wheat from the chaff, of refining his people. And, uh, yeah, Satan starts immediately deceiving the nations. Uh, so those are, that are gullible, the non-believers, those that are not firmly entrenched in uh, their beliefs of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it talks about to the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. So, okay, well, now here we got Gog and Magog again. So the question is, what does the Ezekiel 38 and 39 prophecy uh, entail? Does it concern uh, the battle of uh Armageddon in chapter 19 that was against Antichrist army and just that or does it uh, or is it about the gathering of the battle that we're going to read about after the millennium or is it a little bit of both well considering when we read Ezekiel 38 and 39 and that uh, for example there's seven months period of a post-battle cleanup around Jerusalem and more importantly that included the burial of all the bodies from Armageddon into the valley of ha Hamongog, and that also included the uh, the corpse of the Antichrist. So Ezekiel 38 and 39 is mostly, most likely just reference to Revelation 19. Nevertheless, the book of Ezekiel is very important, and it's something that we cannot ignore because Ezekiel talks about the resurrection and the kingdom in chapter 37, the luring and destroying of Gog from Magog, and we see a little bit of that here, uh, and the new temple, uh, and the new Jerusalem, uh, found in Ezekiel 40 through 43, and even maybe a couple of chapters after that. So, um, let's read on. They marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Okay, so they surrounded the camp of the saints. Well, the saints, uh, saints about 13 times been used in Revelation and is always referred to those who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Christians. But now we're in the millennium. So we've already got the mystery of Jews and Gentiles being brought into one, into the church. So... The chances are the saints here is just referring to the church being both Jew and Gentile, or shall we say Gentiles grafted in uh, to the, the Jewish nation. And the beloved city. Well, the beloved city is Jerusalem. So we'll ask the question, but we're not there yet. Which Jerusalem? The old Jerusalem or, or the uh, new Jerusalem? Well, most likely not the new Jerusalem. Still the old Jerusalem. Uh, however, this time, what do we see? Fire comes down from heaven and consumes them. God is not wasting time. He just is like, okay, I've let you had your campaign. And you, by the way, Satan is so much more powerful than the Antichrist. And it was such a struggle uh, but uh, you know what? Uh, we overcame the Antichrist, um, but not this time. This time, the Lamb of God, just with his word, he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, he destroys uh, Satan and his army, just like he, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the big differences, at least in my mind, is that at the Battle of Armageddon, it was the Antichrist and his army that was occupying Jerusalem. Uh, so in one sense, um, uh, they were the occupiers. Well, that's not the case now. Jesus is in Jerusalem. Jesus has his temple. He's the one reigning. And therefore, it's just no games. It's just a very decisive, quick destruction of fire coming down from heaven. Uh, now, 
fire coming down from heaven, at least in my mind, that's just further proof that we're still in the millennial age of the existing heaven because heaven has not come down, the new Jerusalem has not come down to earth. And basically what we're doing here is we're fulfilling 1 Corinthians 15, verse 25, where Jesus must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, which we're seeing here. And then we read in verse 10, And the devil who had deceived them, he was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And this is just another reminder, a reiteration that punishment will be eternal. It's not annihilation. It's a conscious life in the lake of fire. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and the sky fled away and no place was found for them. Okay, first and foremost, we're now at the time of final judgment of mankind and we're reading we're seeing a great white throne and the earth and the sky fleeing away it just shows how imposing and formidable is the presence of the almighty god in all of his glory especially in his role as judge uh, we're reminded in exodus uh, chapter 33 though where the Lord said to Moses, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. That's the awesome, glorious presence of God the Father. But there's much more to talk about here. So, who is sitting on the throne? Okay, well, that may be obvious, but maybe it's not. Let's dig into that. In the words of Jesus, John 5, starting verse 21, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, Jesus Christ, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he's the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out. So all are going to come out in their tombs. They're going to hear their, his voice. And then he says, okay, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Okay, so there's the two resurrections. But it all, once again, sounds like it's all coming almost at once or at least simultaneously or consecutively. But who's sitting on the throne? Well, it looks to me like it's the Son. Okay, well, let's read on. Let's go back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, because a lot of this uh, was first foretold back then. Verse 9, as I looked, thrones were placed. Okay. This is plural, uh, but that could be the 24 elders sitting on thrones. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. So that would be God the Father, right? 
His clothing was white as snow, and his hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire, and a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. And thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. And as I looked, the beast, okay, that would be the Antichrist, was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So that would be until the end of the thousand years. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heavens, there came like one like a son of man. So that would be the Messiah. That would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came to the Ancient of Days, so that would be the Father, and was presented before him. And to him, Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, all nations, all languages should serve him, Jesus. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So when we use this to try to answer the question, who's sitting on the throne, the great white throne in, in Revelation 20, verse 11, we read this in Daniel, the ancient of days taking a seat. But one thing to keep in mind, the context here was all around the Antichrist, the Antichrist being killed, judgment being rendered, him being thrown into the lake of fire, and those of his followers locked up in in Hades for a thousand years. So it's actually two different occasions, uh, one being the, after the thousand years, one being Revelation 19 before the thousand years. Okay, Daniel also continues on verse 21. He kind of uh, reiterates all this. He says, As I looked, this horn, which is the Antichrist, made war with the saints and prevailed over them until... The Ancient of Days came, Yahweh, God the Father, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. So in other words, in their favor. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Okay, so that's to the millennial reign, right? He, the Antichrist, shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That's the great tribulation. But the court shall sit in judgment. And his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end, which is the lake of fire. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom, the Messiah's kingdom, shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So once again, we see... Um, a humongous transfer of power and authority. But before that, it was God the Father sitting on the throne, God the Father making judgment um, to the Antichrist. But then after that, what? We see all this massive authority being given to Jesus Christ. So let's read on what happens. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open and then another book was opened which was the book of life and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done and the sea gave up the dead who were in it death and hades gave up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one of them according to what they have done. So this is the first time where we really were seeing like three different resurrections, right? We see this resurrection of the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were open, and then the book of life was open, and they were judged according to what was written in the books, plural, according to what they had done, deeds. But then we have 
the sea giving up its dead. And then we got death in Hades giving up its dead. So there we're seeing a little more division in the resurrections, okay? Uh, works, though, are the evidence that's being presented before the throne. Why? Well, works determine loyalty. They determine obedience. They, de they determine your belief or what you don't believe in. They determine your love. They determine your faithfulness or unfaithfulness to whom it is given to. That's all determined by your works. That's, what's, that's the fruit. And as Jesus even said to the seven churches, what did he say? To all seven, I know your deeds. So works, deeds are important corporately, individually. And here, judgment, uh, this is individual. So the question must be asked, so is judgment here a balance of good works being put on the scale and bad works being put on the scale? And which direction does the scale tip? Because chances are everyone has both good and bad works. And I say chances are because we all have had bad works, but I'm not sure if everybody's had good works. Um, but also keep in mind, there's also more to judgment than just the decision of heaven or hell. There's also the judgment with rewards to the saints. Revelation chapter 11. So, uh, Nine chapters earlier, the nations rage, but your wrath came, Lord, and the time for the dead to be judged, which is now, and for rewarding your saints. So it's like the judgment and rewarding of your saints all being together. It's all happening at the same time. Uh, rewarding your saints, the prophets and the saints and those who fear you, fear your name, both small and great. And then for the others, for destroying the destroyers of the earth. So, with those thoughts, let's look at some supporting scripture. What did Jesus say? Well, we read it early, but we'll read it again. And come out those who have done good for the resurrection of life and for those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Paul says, He... He, being the Lord God, he being Jesus Christ, uh, will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor uh, and immortality, to those he's going to give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. There will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Uh, he says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All means all, every one of us. There's going to be a day that we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether it's good or bad. So what all are we saying here? Well, we're going to discuss this more, but we're going to go jump ahead just for a moment because death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. So why was death and Hades thrown into the lake of fire? Well, um, I think a good reason is because of 1 Corinthians 15, 25, for he must reign, Jesus Christ, until he's put an end of all of his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So if death is now destroyed, it should be thrown into the fire. 
And after the millennium, there's just no more reason to have death or Hades, uh, which is uh, an intermediate state of the dead. This is final. This is the final resurrection, the final judgment. So they're thrown into the fire. Well, there's another thing that we also need to consider, and that is what about the fourth seal? In Revelation 6, verse 7, the fourth seal where John heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and before was what? A pale horse, a sickly green horse, and its rider was named Death and Hades. Or no, its rider's name was Death, and Hades was following him. And they, the two of them, were given authority over a fourth of the earth, which, oh, by the way, about a fourth of the earth is Christians, to kill with a sword and with famine, with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. So this could be judgment specifically um, mentioned for death and Hades that followed the, the horseman called death. So uh, nevertheless, something more important. Another book was opened in verse 12, which is the book of... Of life, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, what about the deeds that we're just talking about? That's an entirely different subject, an entirely different type of judgment when it comes to salvation Salvation is not determined by works. Eternal salvation is determined by putting one's faith, one's hope, one's trust, one's testimony in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's kind of summarized in the next chapter, 21 verse 27 of Revelation, but nothing unclean will enter it, that being the new Jerusalem nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. Okay, that's talking about works, but then it's clarified. Only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That is what counts when it comes to salvation. Okay, well then, what's all this big deal about works? Well, let's go back to what Paul says, because Paul does a great job of explaining this. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. Okay, that's our works. For no one can lay a foundation other than what it, which is laid. That's Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold and silver and precious stones or wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it. What's that day? The day of the great white throne judgment that we're reading about. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one, each individual person has done. And if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Ooh, is that salvation? Read on. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Okay, so works have everything to do with kingdom rewards and the Lamb's book of life, what we put our faith, hope, and trust in has everything to do with salvation. So I hope that clarifies things. So that's the end of chapter 20. And so that pretty much ends the millennium as shown to the Apostle John. 
So then I think it is worthwhile to, to go back and just refresh our minds and do some reviewing. Okay, because what was the gospel that was preached in the New Testament? It was about restoration. So restoration would be like uh, things going back to like the days of the Garden of Eden. Um, things going back before sin, but also what? The establishment of God's kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done. This is what uh, was foretold by the angel Gabriel before Jesus Christ was even born when he was talking to the Virgin Mary. And he says, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name, what? Yeshua. Okay, Jesus is just an, an English um, translation um, of an earlier transliteration. He, he is to be called Yeshua, and Yeshua is Hebrew for what? Salvation. So you are to call him salvation. Jesus Christ is our salvation. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and Lord God will give him what? A throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob. That would be he will reign over Israel forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And then before the introduction of Jesus, we had John the Baptist. And what was he preaching? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What did Jesus Christ himself say? He says, I must proclaim the good news of what? The kingdom of God. That's the gospel message. That is why I was sent. And then what did he instruct his disciples? He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. What was uh, the apostle Paul tasked with? He proclaimed what? The kingdom of God. And he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ and the role that he's going to play in all this with all boldness and without hindrance. So that is the kingdom that is being presented uh, to us uh, in the New Testament. Okay, now I, I, like I always like to do, I like to go back to Daniel in particular, but it could be Daniel, it could be Moses, it could be Isaiah. They're all so vitally important because God came what? Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So anyway, let's go to Daniel. Daniel 9.24, where it says, 77s are decreed for your people, the Jewish people, your holy city, that being Jerusalem, to do what? To finish transgression. That's man's rebellion against God. Well, when did that actually happen? Well, it didn't happen during the millennium, but it happened at the end. The day of judgment, the great white throne of judgment, transgression is now finished to put an end to sin. It's the same scenario. Not during the millennium, there was still sin, uh, but after the millennium, that's when there's an end to sin. To atone for wickedness. Well, that was accomplished at the cross, okay? So that's the first advent, the first coming of Christ to bring in everlasting righteousness, to bring it in. Well, he brought it in, but it wasn't everlasting righteousness during the millennium. But we will see from after the millennium, after the great white throne judgment onward, we will see everlasting righteousness. To seal up vision and prophecy, well, we're seeing that being done right before our eyes. Uh, we only got two more chapters of Revelation and to anoint the most holy place. Well, we could say that was done in the interim with the restored uh, temple. Was this the temple as foretold by the prophet Ezekiel? Uh, we're not sure, but uh, uh, very possibly. After all, we got a thousand years of a temple. But the eternal fulfillment of the most holy place is not going to be a temple. The eternal fulfillment of the most holy place will be the new Jerusalem. There will be no temple, but there will be a throne. And it will be God living with his people in the new Jerusalem. So that will be post-millennial. 
So the conclusion here from reviewing uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, is the millennium is kind of like an interim final phase of uh, Jesus cleaning up, of testing and trial for the nations, for mankind. Uh, At the end, Jesus is going to destroy Satan. He's going to destroy all rebellion. And there's going to be a final judgment. That's it. It's final. Heaven or hell. uh, With God's kingdom having uh, many or few rewards, or maybe even none. And then comes God's eternal kingdom. So one thing we got to keep in mind when we look at all these Old Testament prophecies and what the the prophets saw and foretold and what Jesus foretold and, and Paul foretold, we still have to look at it and try to clarify, well, does that apply to the millennium, the millennial kingdom, or does that apply to the eternal kingdom that happens after the millennium? Okay, so hopefully that will kind of open our eyes uh, with a with a new lens, a new perspective of how to read some of these Old Testament prophecies, because some of these Old Testament prophecies that talks about uh, uh, God's kingdom and all that, there's still death. Uh, it's just not uh, not premature death, shall we say? So that would be part of the millennium, not part of the eternal. Paul did a great job. I keep going back to Paul, and I and oh, I love what he says. Back to First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Remember, I said First Corinthians fifteen is so important in understanding eschatology and end time and and revelation in general. Where Paul says, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Yes, the first fruits of those who have been who have fallen asleep. Yes. For as by a man came death, that would be Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. So that would be the son of man. That's the reason why Jesus Christ had to take on flesh. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But then it says, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. And then at his coming, the parousia, those who belong to Christ the bride of Christ. And then comes the end of the millennium. Okay, just remember, the end of time is also the end of the millennium when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. That is when God's eternal kingdom begins. That's the good news. That's the good news is God's kingdom. Your kingdom come. Our Father in heaven, your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth. That's the good news. But he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority, every power. So after he destroys Satan and his army, Uh, is destroyed, which happens at the end of the thousand years. For he must reign. So he, being Jesus Christ, must reign until he, Jesus Christ, has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to to be destroyed is death itself, right? That's what happens at the great white throne judgment, the casting of death and Hades into the eternal lake of fire, And then, of course, also the casting of all his enemies in the lake of fire. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he, Jesus, is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself, will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. This is when God's eternal kingdom begins. Okay, Uh, this was a difficult chapter. I hope I hope I did not sow 
uh, as much uh, uh, confusion as I did clarification. Um, as uh, we did not go into the amillennial camp or the uh, postmillennial camp, uh, but those would have just, I think, added confusion rather than clarity. So we end with chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. So let me say that again. John sees a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, Jesus Christ. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Hallelujah. 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 Amen and amen. Lord God, we look forward to that day. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And with that, we say yes and amen.